Hi, I'm Stephen Feinberg, Executive Director of the Rhode Island Film and Television Office. Our guest tonight is an award-winning filmmaker. He's worked on Family Guy and most recently directed a movie that I think is hilarious called The Wrong Todd. And he just won a new award from the Rhode Island International Film Festival called the George Millay Sci-Fi and Fantasy Award. I welcome Rob Schulbaum to the set of Double Feature. Thanks for having me. Buddy, you have been busy. I know you were like in L.A. last week and then you bounced back to Rhode Island. You just received an award, right? Yes, yeah, it was quite a week. Uh, when it rains, it pours and I, I welcome the, the rain. So <laughs> Wonderful. So, so let's, um, let's talk about your, your, your past so the audience gets to know who you are. You're a Rhode Island filmmaker. Um, how did you even get involved in film and creativity? Talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, I grew up in Smithfield, okay. uh, and there wasn't, at the time, in the 90s, there wasn't much of a film department in, those, in high schools, at right. least not in ours. Um, so we kind of made our own. Uh, there was uh, a bunch of language students um, who would get together. We had the same teacher. And one of the assignments every year was to make a movie. So I would offer to make their movies just to, you know, stay sharp. I didn't know Spanish, but I'd do it anyway. Yeah. Um, and, you know, use my dad's camcorder. And, and it was a time when things were, uh, movies were starting to become democratized. Um, so we were able to kind of make our fun little projects and have a private film festival at the school. So were you always um, interested in, in uh, film? Oh, as yeah. A, as a kid? Yeah, ever since I went to see, I, I know it's cliche, I went to see Jurassic Park in the theater, and I said... That's it. I want to do that. Cool. Uh, and ever since, been kind of making my way towards it. That's funny. I I, um, I was the same way. I think I saw Duel, mm. and I said somebody made that. <laughs> yeah. Like you could tell. It's always some... Spielberg. Yeah, one but, way or another. but yeah, yeah, but someone made it. You could yes. get a sense that there was someone behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so you grew up in Rhode Island, and how did you end up working on the Family Guy? How did that happen? Uh, well, I, uh, I moved out to L.A., um, as many of us who want to be in the film industry do. Um, and I just I kind of bounced around from a couple PA gigs, and then I, I met a friend who got staffed on Family Guy, so went in for an interview and, um, and uh, yeah, got the job. At the time, it was coordinating PAs, so it wasn't exactly, uh, you know, what I, where I wanted to be going, but it was a step in the right direction for an early 20-something guy. Now, now... Uh, there was a there was a couple of Rhode Island connections with Family Guy. Did that help yes. you? No. <laughs> well, to the to the production people, I don't think it mattered too much. But um, we were out to drinks one night, and I was sitting next to Danny Smith, and I'm yes. like, "Oh, I'm from Rhode Island," and he's like, "Oh, where are you from?" And I say, "Smithfield." And he's like, "Are you screwing me?" He thought I was like pulling a prank right, on him. But right. yeah, we we grew up in the same town. I knew his brother. Um, um, it was a very Rhode Island moment. Isn't that great? Yeah. There is a bond. There's a special bond. Like when Peter Farrelly won the Academy Award and he thanked the great state of Rhode Island. And I thought, <laughs> is there any other filmmaker that would thank a particular state? It's pretty <laughs> rare. Yeah, it's unusual. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> so, so you were working on that as a, a, a production supervising PA, mm -hmm. so to speak, yeah. mm -hmm. production assistant. And then you got into editing, right? You were editing yeah, animatics? Yeah, um, a position opened up, and there's a test you take, and I took the test. I always wanted to be an editor. Um, and uh, luckily, I got that job, and I, I, I think I did that for about eight years. Wow. Um, and at the time, I was learning a lot about comedy and you know watching the writers. I wasn't in the room, but uh, you can glean a lot from the way that they develop a joke and the way that the directors edit the scenes for maximum humor. So uh, it was it was a really good incubator, a really good way to learn. Did you have mentors? Did you have you had any mentors in your life? Oh yeah, loads. I mean none in a in an official capacity. Right. But, you know, going back, um, you know, just starting from my parents and having teachers that supported me. Um, you know, lots of lots of friends who would kind of push me to do the things that I wanted to do. Right. And now you had friends in L.A. when you went out there? Yes. Or, uh, actually, the guy in the movie, Jesse Rosen, um, he had moved out there about a year earlier, and he said, I'm working on the Stamos show, and they need a PA. Get out here. Oh, so, that's cool. Um, I was, yeah, at the time, had nothing else going on, so I packed up my car and went out there. And did, you, uh, did you go to film school at all or have any film, like, uh, education? 
Yeah, I went to uh, I went to Emerson College. Yep. I actually have a degree in new media. Okay. Um, which is a meaningless term now. It's, right. It's not new anymore. Right. It's like a it's like a degree in pantomime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a, essentially a, a, a glorified film degree with some like web stuff thrown right. in. Right. Yeah. It changes so fast. Right. Right. And okay, so you you. Uh, you no fear. You went out to Los Angeles. You're working on this stuff. So now you're are, you're getting involved in the animatics. Mm -hmm. um, are you? Is that helping? Tell me how that's helping you with your with your sense of production and filmmaking. Well, animatics uh, is is kind of a, a special case in the world of editing. You know, most people they think when they think of editing, they think you pull down a take and you pick the best take and you're cutting back and forth. But an animatic is when you take a storyboard. Um, each frame drawn out uh, and kind of marry it to the audio that's already been recorded. Uh, so it's like a pre-visualization, right? Exactly. It's like a rough draft of the show. Right. But that's where a lot of the comedy happens, especially with a show like Family Guy. Um, they do a lot of endurance gags, and sometimes five frames is a lot funnier than six frames. So you spend a lot of time just moving stuff around, figuring out where the joke's going to work the best. Is that, that sense of timing... Is that something that you do on your own, or are you saying, hey, Billy, is this funnier? Like, <laughs> how does that work? Uh, well, at, at Family Guy, we would, we would get the audio, and we'd get the boards, and it was our job just to kind of sculpt it. Marry them. Yep, put them together. Uh, and then the director would come in, and then they'd get the chance to say, you know, oh, cut this scene earlier, or add a couple frames here. Um, and that's where I learned a lot about, you know, what's what's funny and and what what works is it you think a lot of it's primarily on instinct or or is there something like a science to it you know family guy when you've when the show's been around for that long there's kind of a rhythm yeah exactly there's uh there's some standards that maybe they're not written down but people know to follow them um and if you're in early you get to kind of develop that rhythm okay can you give an example like uh, can where that can you can we get deeper into that a little bit? Like how, like a specific example where that would, would that play? Yeah, well, um, Family Guy kind of pioneered, like I said, the, the endurance gag, which is just a joke that goes on for way too long. Yeah. It's, it's funny, and then you're kind of like, oh, is this still going? And then it gets funny again, and there's like a, a roller coaster, there's a pattern. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the small pauses and the gaps, which is something that we'd work on in animatics. Okay. So there's, there's one gag where like Peter has a forklift and he's picking up a dead whale, <laughs> and it's just like that in itself. I it maybe maybe not the funniest thing, but when when you see him like struggling with it and then pausing, and that that's when it, it, the humor comes in. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Um, so after the Family Guy, what happens next in your world, Rob? What what, what was going on then? Uh, well, um, my wife Kim and I had decided it was it was time for change, and um, having grown up in Rhode Island, this seems like a good place to go. Um, we started a family. My you know. Uh, my parents are here. Yep. Um, Rhode Island's great, and we can afford to live here. So right. um, we decided to make the move. I quit my job at Family Guy, um, put a script together, uh, and that script was the wrong Todd. That script was the wrong Todd. Mm -hmm. And you originally had that as a short film, right? Yeah, that's right. We made the short out in L.A., um, kind of a proof of concept. Uh, how long was the was the script, and how long was the film? The film ended up being about nine and a half minutes. Okay. So ten pages, ten minutes. Yep. Um, a little long for you know a modern short film, but um, we premiered at Holly Shorts in I think 2014. Anyway, people seemed to like it, and they somebody said to me, you know, I'd watch more of that, um, and I felt like they meant it, so I uh, stretched out the script. Did you have a plan that it was going to be a feature, or totally not? I mean, did you say this is I'm I'm just going to do a short film to showcase my talents? Or yeah, that's that's exactly right. It was basically to to stay sharp. I had been working on another script and I couldn't figure it out, so I was like, I'll do this other thing for a bit. Oh. Okay, and and what kind? Of, can I ask what kind of budget you had for for that short film? Yeah, it was oh the short film. Yeah, um, it was digging deep now. Uh, maybe about fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. So it was it was quite low. Yeah. Called in a lot of favors. And how many days? Do you remember how many days? Two you, days. Two days of filming. Yep. And. You created this thing. People like responded positively, and hey, you're gonna make a feature out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We. Um, uh, I took a look at it again and realized that there was more that could be explored. Uh, we ended up adding a, a, another character, Dave, um, who wasn't in the short, right. um, and ended up being, you know, a huge character in the in the feature. 
so yeah, stretched stretched that out, added some elements, explored it a little more deeply, and then and then we started looking for funding. Now, okay. What well, did you have a goal in mind when you finished that script? Now, this tell us the story of the wrong Todd. <laughs> tell us what that. Tell us what it's the about. The plot or yeah. the backstory the, to the, the plot, and then we'll talk about the backstory. But go ahead. Yes. Well, uh, and the wrong Todd is about uh, Todd who faces losing everything when his evil twin from Parallel Universe comes to steal his girlfriend. <laughs> so, pretty simple concept. Um, I like the man versus self angle of it. Right. Uh, so. Yeah, in, in the feature-length film, he, um, he finds, he, his, his clone comes, shows up, and sends him back to another universe, sends him to a different universe. So he has to figure out how to get back. Meanwhile, the people in his life are realizing, oh, wait, something's different about this Todd. Uh, he looks and, the same, but he's a little off. Yeah, sometimes he's better in a lot of ways, but maybe a little scary. So. Right, right. Yeah. Um, what inspired it? You know, I've, I've always been a really big fan of sci-fi. Yep. Star Trek, The Next Generation, yep. uh, Star Wars, Alien. You know, right. I, I love a lot of those um, classic sci-fi series and movies. Um, but I also like relationships. Like, it, it's so, I was looking for a way to kind of have a sci-fi movie, but have it be about people's relationships. Something real. Yeah. And it was, it was helpful, you know, we didn't have a, a big budget, so we just kind of touched on the sci-fi, but made the movie about the people in the film. Right. And um, did you have, when, when you finished the script, the feature script, did you have an idea in mind about what kind of budget you wanted or did you, did you have um, higher goals as far as production costs and values and actors mm -hmm. and then alter that or what was, the, what yeah, was well, your dream? I was, I was hoping for $100 million. Um, naturally, yep. uh, but then we we scaled it down to about fifty thousand. Right, right. Um, and that's what we ended up shooting with. So no, this this was always kind of. Uh, you never. You, I guess what I'm asking is, do you ever think of selling it in the mainstream Hollywood system, where maybe a studio would pick it up mm. or something like that? Was nope, that not never for a minute? Never. Yeah. I uh, we came out here specifically to avoid that. Um, I had seen friends doing that, and you know there was definitely a path to that. Uh, but it, it didn't feel like the way I wanted to be making movies. I wanted to be, you know, with a small crew, kind of running around, being scrappy, calling in favor. And that, that was the more uh, rewarding approach, I felt. Right. Um, and also then you get to do what you want to do. Right. Um, so that's one of the main reasons I moved out here to Rhode Island, where there's that independent spirit the, and people do it for the love of making movies. Right. And because I think, too, you can get caught in that trap in L.A. of waiting for permission. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And, yep. and um, it used to be where you I think you were talking about democratizing filmmaking back in the day. You couldn't afford to do the 35 millimeter you know, your film on 35 millimeter with all the equipment and all that stuff would have cost quite a bit more. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you've got that freedom, and um, I think that really does help the independent filmmaker. And yes. you didn't wait for permission. <laughs> did you, yeah. did you, um, did you, you said you made it for 50000 right? Yeah, approximately. Yeah. What was your original hope as far as budget was concerned? Were you hoping to raise more or? Honestly, we would have done it with it, whatever we got. You know, the, the goal was to make the movie and we, we kick-started it in okay. part. And there was a few private investors. Um, and, you know, we, we looked at what we had and we said, this is what we can do and this is how many days we can shoot. And thank God Anthony was there to- Anthony to, Ambrosino. Anthony Ambrosino to help us make that happen. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we had, it, it really came down to just having a lot of great people um, and working with what we have. It's unbelievable the amount of production value you have. Oh, I, yeah. Well, if you can thank uh, Mike McGillnick, our, our DP. Um, he, he was able to get that great look and we had great um, production designers. Right. Who did um, your production design and who built like, a, you also had like a, a great um, uh, s props. Yeah, well the, uh, uh, Nydia Killon was the, our, um, our designer um, and Mary Haramchik helped her. Uh, and it was basically just the two of them, but they'd breeze through a set and it would just be transformed. Unbelievable. Uh, it looked great on camera. Yeah, and I love the inside with the lab. Like the yes, the lab. Well, we have to thank Lee Carvonen. Um, he he's a, a set designer and prop maker local to Rhode Island. Um, and I brought him an RV one day, and I was like, 
do whatever you the want. The magic all happens in this RV. We should let the <laughs> audience know, right? Yeah, there's kind of a lo-fi <laughs> portal to another dimension, and it's in an RV, so it moves around. Right. Um, but yeah, we I dropped this off at, at Lee's house, and he, he called me up one day. He said, there's a tanning booth on the side of the road. Do you want me to pick it up? And of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. So he brings it back, and that becomes the portal. So that's the kind of production we were. Right, right. Mm -hmm. How much time did you have in pre-production? Um, you know, it's it, it was a slow ramp up, but uh, probably just a couple months. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you did you do a lot of like storyboarding, planning, that kind of thing, or were you just going with the flow and? Yeah, I met I met with Mike, the DP, early on, and I. I how did brought, you know Mike? How, how did that How did that relationship start? Um, I put out uh, just a, a a cold call for for DPs. Wow. Um, and I saw his reel, and I said, "This guy's great." And, how many and luckily he was available. How so. many DPs uh, had sent you material to look at? Oh, God, that's uh, <laughs> so long ago. Probably probably looked at reels for uh, 10 or 15 yep. DPs. And did, um, you meet, did you just do it based on what you saw, or did you meet with a few of them to see if you guys had a vibe? Yeah, we'd meet if it was practical. If they were, uh, Mike, for instance, lives in uh, western Connecticut. Um, so it, I don't think I met with him. I just talked with him on the phone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you you want to try and get to know the person too. It's, right. it's more than just the the, the picture. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, did you guys feel like you had the same, uh, I guess, verbiage where you you just felt like, yeah, he gets me and I get him. Yeah. In our our first meeting, I I, I showed up with you know about twenty four pages of storyboards, uh, and we were going through it. And we realized that we had the same plan for the whole thing, so we just stopped storyboarding it, uh, and we were just able to kind of talk about it. And what and kind of things were, were you talking about? Like as far as your your planning, you having similar plans. What what does that mean? Well, a lot of it, you know, for the the trick shots where there has to be two Todds, um, yep. you know, you have to kind of approach that a certain way. Um, and I think we were already on the same page about how that was going to happen. Um, and just the general look of the film, you know, it's it's kind of an intimate close up production there's not a ton of wides yeah um, and you know just kind of deciding on how things are going to progress it had a realism to it were there certain films you guys talked about that where you had we talked about the look like that yeah we talked about you know other sci-fi relationship movies um, like what eternal sunshine and the spotless mind yeah um, safety not guaranteed I love that movie yeah there's and I then I mention that that you guys could be um, a double feature you did, and I, I was very complimented by that. Oh, good. Because I remember seeing Great it. Movie. I said, boy, I'd like to see Safety guar Not Guaranteed in your film would be, <laughs> we should do that at the Odeum. Uh, I, I love that. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah, awesome. it had that same feel. And that's a guy now, uh, Colin Tebero, who ended up directing mm -hmm. Jurassic World. Yep. Yeah. We'll be talking about what your dreams are in a, in a moment, <laughs> <laughs> where you want to go next. Um, what were some of the surprises? that happened uh, during the production. The good surprises and maybe some of the ones that you were like, the, the, the challenges also. Uh, well, one of the biggest surprises was that we got everything in 12 days. Um, we weren't sure if that was gonna happen. Uh, we were prepared to add more time if we needed to, but. Um, How many hours per day were you working? Uh, we were about the t a 12 hour 12 hour, hour day. day. Six there's day weeks or five days? Six week? day weeks. Wow. So, okay. But there's diminishing returns you yes. know, after 12 hours. Uh, you, you don't want to put people through that. So. And, and there's the concern of safety getting home. Yes, and, absolutely. And, and everybody lived locally, so they could, or they did you put them up? or? Yeah, we would get hotels or Airbnbs for people who were, were not local. Yep. Um, or if they had a long day, we'd, yeah, we'd find, a, find a place to stay. Good, safety is everything. Yeah, and, you know, we had, we had a few, like, minor stunts, but uh, it, the, always the first concern is making sure that everyone is safe. Good, yep. Um, so... So, so you had so th some of the challenges were the fact that well, it, well, you said one of the surprises was that you were able to get it done in twelve <laughs> days. Right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, we were surprised. There was, I mean, there were so many little surprises. It's hard to uh, really pin pin it down. Sometimes I would I would write a scene that was kind of supposed to be a slow down moment and it was supposed to be serious, but then like Sean Mar Sean Carmichael would come in. And it would be hilarious all of a sudden. So now it's a funny scene. So the actors would find these nuances in the script that I hadn't really thought of. Now, how were you able to find your actors? Did you have a local casting director, or what did you? Uh, we did open casting call. Yep. Um, well, Jesse Rosen, I've known since college, so right. that was kind of uh, he was a bit mm -hmm. of a shoo-in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we we did uh, backstage. We did it online. I I looked at films from 48-hour festivals. 
I got recommendations. It was really just kind of looking at everybody out there. Um, a lot of people sent me their reels. Some people I reached out to um, yeah. independently. Uh, and and yeah, we had we had them read together and, and just uh, got lucky that our top picks were, were all available. Were you, did you feel in your heart you were giving opportunities to people that maybe they hadn't had before? Uh, you know, at the time it didn't necessarily feel that way. I, yeah. I kind of felt like I kind of felt like they were doing me a favor, <laughs> yeah, yeah, lending their expertise to me, yeah. Um, and now that we've been able to get into some festivals and get some some notoriety, um, I'm really I'm really happy and hope that that helps them as well, right? You know, rising I, tide I, and whatnot. I, we had uh, Karen Allen uh, here, who was in Raiders of the Lost Ark, mm -hmm. and, but before that, her big break was Animal House, and uh, if you look at the cast of Animal House, except for John Belushi, who was in um, right. uh, Saturday Night Live, everyone was like new and I mm -hmm. said boy that was a John Landis and the casting director that they really took a lot of gambles and um, oh and Donald Sutherland was also like the star of the movie the guy with the <laughs> right. name but yeah. she said yeah um, she goes that was like a real big risk for the casting mm -hmm. and the director I said but it was really neat is when you were in those movies you were those characters you were Otter you you know these were the they they didn't bring anything with them yes. as far as Previous identity. It's hard to imagine anyone else in right, that role. Right, right. They yeah. were those characters. Yeah. Um, did you have to do uh, what kind of rehearsal time did you did you take? Oh, there was virtually none. None. Yeah. I mean, we'd I would talk to each of the individual actors, um, and they would talk to each other, um, but there wasn't a lot of time to to just get in a room and and work it out. So a lot of it was while camera was setting up, we'd okay. be rehearsing. And sometimes the first take was a rehearsal. Did you guys do like a read through with everybody, and did that that help at all? Yeah, we did a table read, um, and I think, uh, yeah, we'll have to ask them if it was helpful. For me, it was it was confusing. Why? Why? <laughs> Why do you say that? Um, well, keeping track of multiple versions of different people without like that visual, it was it was very strange. Right. Um, but it was it was a good way to kind of get a sense of how the actors were going to read it. Um, and have a plan for how to kind of guide the scenes and, and work everything out. Were there any moments where you were like, oh my God, like any moments where you might have said, I'm in trouble, or oh, I, I hope I know what I'm doing? Were there any of those? Yeah, every three every or four minutes or so <laughs> that would happen. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but then once in a while you'd nail it. Uh, and you know, the, being on set's a funny thing. Everything you think that you is, planned is yeah or everything that's do you think is amazing doesn't turn out quite as good as you think but also everything that you think is going to kill your career is not really as bad as it seems right uh, once you get into the editing booth, did, so. did you also feel that um being open-minded to your collaborators your actors and your cinematography the importance of having a nice environment and then also being open to finding uh happy accidents oh yeah i mean it was it was it was kind of the, the, the prime directive of the set, uh, you know, because there was no one person who was, you know, th there wasn't a whole lot of ego on our set because everybody was stretching, right. everybody was trying to do a little more than they usually do. Um, so I think, I think it was just a matter of uh, finding the best way to tell the story yep. um, and being open to, to people's ideas. And how much time did you have in post? Uh, too much time. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, I think I ended up editing the movie for two years because I, I was also the editor. Right. Um, so there wasn't really anybody breathing down my neck. We got we had the time to kind of hone it. Hone it. Yeah. Did it go through a lot of variations? Uh, different um, where you finish it and show it to some friends, get some feedback, show it again. Like were, were there a lot of variations of your uh, edit? There was some time to toy around with it. Um, it. Most most of the work happened within scenes though because uh, most of the scenes built upon the previous. Yep. There wasn't, I've worked on productions where it's like, maybe this scene should be before this and it's right, almost right. kind of non-linear, right. but this, everything has to happen in a certain order. Right. Um, so luckily the script made sense when we got into the edit booth. Um, but yeah, most of it was just making making the, the moments work. Um, how is this gonna be the funniest? How is this going to be touching? Mm -hmm. How do we balance those two things without giving people whiplash? Yeah. Um, you know, it was, it was that kind of approach. Did you um, find yourself filming uh, uh, 
chronologically or out of, out of uh, sequence? No, we went where the, wherever Anthony told us to okay, go. Okay, so you just basically, <laughs> right. Because I thought yeah. it was interesting. I, don't, I, um, I just uh, listened to an interview with Sam Mendes who did 1917. Yep. And they pri mostly did it in chronological order. And he said, if we didn't do it in chronological have you seen 1917? Not yet, no. Okay, well, there's this really nice scene where this character is singing. He goes, if we hadn't done it in chronological order, I don't think I would have allowed that scene to breathe as I did. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very interesting. He yeah. said, if we shot it out of sequence, it would not have been that scene that sometimes just you catch your breath. Yes. So well, the original plan um, before I consulted with Anthony was to have each parallel universe as two different shoots. Oh. Um, so to kind of encapsulate those feelings, yes, um, and also to to make it easier for people to like change hairstyles and things like that. Oh, wow. um, but Anthony looked at the schedule and said, "No, no." Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> so, so the Wrong Todd won uh, Film Threat Award. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Scene, also. Yeah, we won a few awards at Scene, Best Ensemble Cast, uh, Best uh, Jury Award for Best Picture, Film Threat, Best Indie of the Year. That's unbelievable. Um, we also won in Austin, Best Picture. Yeah, I mean, this, this one keeps surprising me. It's, it's amazing. What, what's next now on the horizon? Uh, well, the, the Wrong Todd, I should mention, The Wrong Todd's out. Um, you can... Showtime. It's on Showtime. You can also download it on Amazon, Google Play, order DVD. Recommend whatever. you do. It's wonderful. Yep. Yes, thank you. Um, so, yeah, now that we're kind of wrapping that up, uh, um, back to the, the, to the script, back to scripting. So I've got a couple ideas in a similar vein. Yeah. Um, sci-fi, light sci-fi movie with yeah. like centered around relationships. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just just working on that and, and hope to start shopping that around soon. Well, we can't wait to see more of your work and your your team's work. I love the camaraderie you've built. You've you're almost like Orson Welles, and you've got the Mercury <laughs> players. But um, it's really a terrific. I think the you brought a lot of magic back to Rhode Island film, and I really appreciate that. And I know that our uh, viewers are going to see the wrong Todd. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you, Steve. And thank, thank you for you. everything you've done. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah.